So guys, this is Hyten Shaw. He is going to continue with a Q&A from what he talked about as far as being able to find your marketing channels. And we have got people here, Poland, Brazil, awesome. India. Great. They are ready to hit you and let's get started. Should I duck and cover? Yeah. Do you think? They're going to hit me, so i, I got to protect myself, right? Oh, my God, you're so funny. You know, we're from Texas, so we just say those kind of things. Yeah, I like it. It's good. <laughs> All right, so our first question is, how does the marketing framework be adapted to services, consulting, business, before in transitions? You can apply it to a services business. You just have to answer those questions just like you would for any kind of product. It's not any different. Um, generally, where people hang out, what you'll notice about most services businesses is, most of them are getting a lot of services from events. So the, the, the customer is usually hanging out at some events. So that's Very probably nice. the key marketing channel for services businesses. And how you engage them is just add value. So since yeah. inbound marketing leads cost 61% less than outbound, how can startups divide their budget better? Uh, I think startups generally don't have that much money. So uh, in terms of dividing your budget between inbound and paid, uh, in my experience, I, I tend to go for things that don't cost money uh, unless you can make, the, make, make those channels profitable. So the easiest way to think about it is if you're going to go pay for a marketing channel, just make sure you know the cost of getting a sign up, getting a lead, and ideally getting revenue from it and see if you have enough money. Usually startups don't have that much money to spend on paid channels, so the channels you decide to choose are not paid and they tend to be inbound. Um, I don't really agree with any of the stats that I see around inbound versus paid. Um, but when you're a startup, your whole job is to find opportunities that other people aren't finding. Uh, that's why I would start with those questions because it's really help. It really helps you find those opportunities. Which one of your startups was most difficult, and does it get easier with time? Um, I think they're all difficult, to be honest, um, and they're difficult in different ways. Like when we started Crazy Egg, we had never built. Um, software at scale before. So finding engineers and learning all that stuff. I'm not an engineer, I fake it. Um, and uh, so that was really difficult there. At Kissmetrics, the difficulties were more around competition, raising money, and a whole bunch of things that came at us as a result of that, and learning how to do that. So I think it's just always a learning, and I wouldn't want to put any one as difficult as any other one. I'd say, does it get easier? Um, no. We're all starting in the lower left quadrant. Yeah. How do we drive that first traffic, especially when the product is in development? Yeah, so when the product's in development, um, if you're starting the lower left quadrant, that's the one where it's low traffic, low conversion. Um, and uh, you're just trying to find a channel where you can get a lot more traffic. So all I would tell you to do is look at all the things that are actually kind of working in terms of traffic and just try to get more traffic. One of the easiest things to do today that didn't exist when I started Crazy Egg, maybe it kind of did with Kissmetrics, but not really, is that you can start blogging or start tweeting about what you're doing and start building an audience pretty quickly. So the, the blanket recommendation, whether you're a services firm, a mobile app, uh, a web app, or anything, would be start writing, a, start writing blog posts and start collecting emails for people that are interested in the problem that you're trying to solve for them. And that'll generally get you a few hundred or more people right away. Uh, right away meaning within a few weeks or a month, as long as you're genuine about what you're doing. While you're in development, that is something that you can actually spend time on. And it's totally worth it because you want that early feedback. Are there any new channels you're experimenting with in new, new tools that you're using? Good question, Lucas. Um, I, I mentioned uh, how we did Kiss Insights and made it a product-based sort of marketing channel is what I like to call it, or a growth loop. Um, I would really be thinking about how do you integrate that kind of thing into your own product. So for example, can you make it so that when a customer signs up for your product, there's some way that they expose more people to it? That's probably one of the key things that I'm exploring in everything I'm working on right now. Um, and I would recommend all of you to think of that. Um, outside of that, uh, I've seen Instagram actually work for almost any market today. So I would think of Instagram. I've even seen Snapchat work from a conversion standpoint for a lot of startups as well. So just think about the new hot thing 
and play around with it a little bit, try to understand it, and see if you know, there's any opportunity there. I wouldn't tell you, hey, you're gonna make a ton of money or, or anything using Instagram or Snapchat, but I would say that like, you should explore some of these new things because um, they can be really valuable. Uh, for sure. But at the same time, the biggest channel today ends up being the one you build yourself that's integrated into your product. How do you know your product really has a market? How long do you wait? So I have a lot of questions that I tend to have after I get asked questions like that. Um, how long you wait is as long as you have. Um, I'm kidding. Uh, how, how do you know if it's working? Um, generally, when people use it, they're happy about it. Uh, there's a lot of different measures from their tweeting about it to they're sending you customer love through customer support or in an ideal world, they're actually using the product. So the most fundamental thing you can track yourself is that once people sign up, are they actually using it? So are they engaged with it? Are they retained? Those are the kind of things that I would be looking at. What would you not look for in hiring a head of marketing and sales for a B2C automotive startup preparing for production 30 to 100K units a year? Um, so recently, uh, my friend and I, who do a, a, a podcast together called The Startup Chat, talked about how to hire a marketer. So it's thestartupchat.com, and it's like episode 170 something, I think. Just go look at that. That's going to give you 20 minutes of like pure gold, according to other people uh, that have said that they liked it, about how to hire a marketer. So that's the first thing I would say. The, the, the biggest thing I would say about B2C and automotive uh, especially in that category, is it's likely that you might be better off focusing on um, how do you get, again, I'm a broken record on this, but how do you get your users to recommend other users or bring other users into the product? Uh, that might be a bigger strategy than some of the other ones you're thinking of. Another thing is if you have a little bit of capital, Facebook ads work really well for mobile, mobile apps right now. How did you pick your early adopters? How did we pick our early adopters? So that's the whole question. Uh, we asked those three questions about you know, what does our product do, what's the problem it solves, and who's it best for? Um, the simple answer to your question when you're really early on and you might not be able to answer those questions or you have like a list of 10 different types of customers is actually go talk to all the different types of customers, number one, if you can do that and see if they really have that problem your product solves. Uh, that's a really easy way to do it. The second is if you already have people signing up for your product and using it, really dig into who's getting the most value from it and ask them. Uh, I like asking them the question, um, what kind of person would get the most benefit from this product? If you just ask them that, they'll generally give you an answer, and sometimes you'll be surprised at that answer, and that can help you identify that. Blaine, raise your hand. Thank you. What are your best practices for building or for bridging analytics between web and mobile apps, and do you recommend any tools? Sure. Um, I hate tools, even though I built them before, um, just because all the tools are there's always something wrong with them, even the ones I've built. Uh, and so it's hard for me to recommend a specific tool to you. Um, what I would say is if you have web traffic and mobile traffic, um, when it comes to like anonymous visitors, you're probably going to end up tracking that in, in a tool like Amplitude or Mixpanel or even Kissmetrics, depending on your affordability and what, you, what flavor you like. The key thing is make sure that there's a login or a sign up on your mobile app and your web app. And then that's when you actually tie everything together. I would actually start with making sure that's logged very well in your database as to like where people came from and what, what part of the product they're using, whether it's mobile or web. And then as long as people are signing up, logging in into, in those two areas, you can sort of merge the data and you can look at one single customer. So the recommendation would be more about tooling in any of those analytics tools, not a specific tool I would recommend. I'd like to start testing marketing channels well before the product is ready for sign up slash purchases. Any suggestions for pre-sales testing? That's a great question. Um, landing pages where you collect emails and then throwing your ads at them so you can understand what's the customer acquisition cost, what's the clicks, uh, what kind of ads work at least to get click through. So you have to look at it in stages. So if you don't have the product, people can't buy it yet. Stage one is understand what ads get the most clicks. Stage two is understand what ads get the most conversions to an email. Stage three is understand what ads get the most purchases and how much all the costs are around those things. So depending on what stage you're at, you can do all that. As of right now, I have three products I'm launching this year and all of them are at stage one or two where I'm just, 
I don't have anything to sell yet or any, anything they can use. I'm just collecting emails and understanding what kind of ads are working, what kind of messaging is working. Do you find that that's where people make their biggest mistake? They don't do enough in stage one or two? Yeah, and they don't do enough of it early on. That's correct. Because you can do that before you have anything. In fact, you can do that to figure out what figure product out what you should use or what customer. So. Repeat the stages. Yeah, the stages is basically what, what ads get the most clicks, what ads get the most email signups, and then what ads get the most purchases. And it's not most, it's just more so metrics around that because you're going to see that one type of ad might get more clicks, but it doesn't get as many purchases. One type of ad might get uh, very little clicks, but it gets a lot of purchases. And you're just trying to make sense of all that. And you're trying to learn how to do testing with the ads because that's where you can test imagery and value propositions and things like that really efficiently and quickly without having to spend all this money on the actual product or changing it or anything like that. Yeah, because I'll hold my hand up and say, yeah. um, after working with Neil, yeah. I totally did how I do my homepage on my website where I made people make choices. Right. None of the traditional navigation. You needed to tell me either, do you want to uh, acquire new clients or do you want growth strategies? And frankly, I thought more people were going to click on the acquire clients and it wasn't. It was four to one they wanted to know about right. growth strategies. So they busted my assumption. There you go. That's key. How do you decide to focus on a target market in which your product hits several audiences, i.e. Evernote? Yeah, I could say a lot about Evernote. Um, well, they were just giving it as an example. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, this is like the problem that Trello had. I mean, they sold for about a half a billion dollars, but they could have been a billion dollar business themselves if they would have just done what I'm going to say, which is when you have a product that's really wide and it's working, your biggest goal should be how do you figure out what are the most lucrative types of customers with the product and then you have some decisions to, to make. Do you make the product, do you keep the product wide and then start building things that help support those people so they'll pay you more money, support them better? Or do you just, especially if you're early on and you're not Evernote or Trello or don't have the capital, then you just start focusing on the customers that make you the most money and just build for them. Can you go into more detail about how to discover where your people are hanging out Referring to your second framework question. Yeah, uh, that's great. Uh, so that's just brainstorming and really thinking through. And sometimes it takes longer than other times. But it's really just thinking through, OK, um, what, one exercise you could do is, let's say for us, it was at Kissmetrics. And we wanted to target marketers. So we would think of, like, what's the day in the life of a marketer? <sighs> what sites are they visiting? What are they doing you know, on a daily basis? And then you think about, well, what are they doing on a yearly basis? Are there certain events that they go to? Then I would even just start Googling things like marketing events or online marketing conference and all that kind of stuff. And then you end up with a pretty long list that you need to prioritize against some criteria. So it's really a brainstormer exercise. It's one where you know uh, I can get hippy dippy with all of you folks and say like, don't be judgmental and just let all the ideas sort of pour out, um, and and then you'll have a long list. And that's usually uh, the approach that I would take because where they hang out and the opportunity you'll find that's non-obvious is what you're looking for. And you can't do that unless you have an exhaustive list. We would have never found the Twitter opportunity if we would have just made it up and said, oh, we're going to go to marketing events and, and sell Kissmetrics or get people to use it. Instead, we really dug in and found an opportunity that we thought we could leverage as a startup. <laughs> so I've got a good one for you. Bring it. Do you use Kissmetrics to get metrics for Kissmetrics? Yeah. Yeah. I don't work on Kissmetrics anymore, but it's constantly being used for it. Um, and uh, we, we had used it from the beginning. Uh, these days at my businesses, we actually don't use many outside tools. Uh, and just because the people that built Kissmetrics are working on those businesses, so we end up doing a lot of stuff with databases. So if you're an engineer, I would use something like Metabase, which is an open source uh, project that allows you to do a lot of data stuff. Um, things like mode analytics are really cool. And then obviously there's segment.com out there that allows you to merge all this. These days, like. The analytics tools are probably going to be quite limiting, to be honest, even though I built them before. Uh, and you might want to actually focus much more on your own database and tracking a lot of that stuff yourself. So when is the right time to focus on brand building versus lead generation if you're in early stages? Um, it depends on your skill set so, and what skill set you want to develop. Um, brand, brand tends to happen over time. And so you have to invest a lot in it with very little ROI in the beginning, usually. So the recommendation would be figure out your lead generation first. And then over time, you can figure out branding. 
Um, this is the opposite advice that my co-founder Neil and I typically use just because we're very good at brand and we already have brands. So if you already have a brand, then use your brand. If you don't already have a brand, then you probably want to focus on lead generation and ROI first. Don't do what I say, or sorry, do what I say, not what I do. It's one of those. My dad used to tell me that <laughs> all the time. You had a different yeah. situation though. So yeah. what are typical KPIs you track to determine effectiveness of campaigns and what tools do you use to track those KPIs? Sure, so the easiest tool to use is the tool that you're using to run the campaign. So for any kind of the paid acquisition campaigns you're using, I would focus on the tool you're actually using. So if it's Facebook ads, use Facebook ads. If it's AdWords, use Google AdWords. Use their conversion tracking. And it's not like, as many of you might know, the analytics tools all have different numbers all the time because they're all tracking things differently. But at least in your ad tool, you know you're spending money in the tool and your conversions are in that tool. You should have it in other tools too, but that should be your sort of place where you're actually manipulating it and looking at it. If you're doing a lot of organic stuff, a lot of it is spreadsheets because the, the data doesn't really connect together. And a lot of the tools out there when you're doing either SEO or you know, uh, trying to game Pinterest or something like that, um, the, the metrics are, are very loosey-goosey and they don't really give you good data. So you're going to have to go in there and look at that data yourself using spreadsheets and stuff like that and putting it in. So how many products can you as an entrepreneur successfully focus on at once? Is it better to really go all in on one or the one you're most passionate about? I don't really believe in passion in the same way most people do, so I'm going to start there. I believe in business. And so um, for me, and this is just me, but I would employ you to like just entertain this for a second. I care about something that can grow and something that can make money at a profit. And that's it. Outside of that, passion to me is, is, a, is, is something where we, we get ourselves to believe we're passionate about things, when in reality, like, that can change, right? And many of us are very fickle about that. So instead, focus on something around sustainability in your life, sustainability in the business you're focused on, um, and, and, and less so on just having to do something that you're super passionate about. It's very rare to find that. Uh, and, and it doesn't necessarily matter as much as you might be thinking. Um, and to answer the question more specifically, um, I don't know a lot of folks that, can, that have a system for doing multiple things at once. And this is another situation where I say, do what I say, not what I do. There are countless things I, have, I spend my energy on and businesses I'm involved in at any given time. Um, that's because I've created a life and a situation where I can do that. I work with people that can do a lot with just like a half hour conversation with me a week or something like that. And they run a lot of things in my businesses. And that's just because of the people I find and the way I think about the world. Um, that is not the case for most people today. So, and if we did that early on in our business, uh, when we had our consulting business, my co-founder and I, we probably wouldn't be where we are today. We focused a lot on that business and making cash uh, and making it profitable for us. So my easy recommendation is if you're really early in, in uh, doing these things and don't necessarily have capital, then focus on the one thing that'll make you money. Because without money, we don't get to do what we love. Hi, and what do you think about freemium models for SaaS, for example, Canva, with their in-app sales of templates? I'm a huge fan. If you can find a way to do a freemium business and a model and also uh, sustain it, which means either you have capital or the freemium business, like what I like to do is allow people to purchase something for my freemium business right during onboarding because that means I can start getting capital really early without having to make it not freemium. So big fan, you should study businesses like Canva and even Evernote and Trello and these things just to figure out how you think about that. But if I'm building a SaaS business today and it's new, which I am right now, a bunch of new ones and old ones, I'm thinking of how to make it freemium just because uh, the free users are, are, are a huge marketing channel, word of mouth, and also uh, make, make, your, make your marketing uh, a lot cheaper. It's not easy though. All right, so our last question is going to be, when is the right time to start optimizing SEO and SEM? As soon as possible. SEO is a lot longer uh, play. So if you're early on, you might not want to think about it too much. And instead, you want to do SEM, so search engine marketing, and understand what keywords are converting, or at least what categories of keywords, since they don't give you keywords anymore uh, as prescriptively. Um, figure out what's converting and what's working for you, and then go focus on SEO, because then your SEO efforts won't be wasted. That being said, SEO takes, a really, it takes longer than ever now. So you have to have a lot of conviction that that's the right strategy for you if you're going to go the SEO route. And what's something that you want to share with the audience that we haven't thought about asking you? Sure. Um, I have two things. One, 
uh, and they're related to each other. One, um, I think a lot of us get a lot of things in our heads that are limiting beliefs. Like, I can't, you know, I'm not good enough. I can't, I ha I can't do multiple things at once. Or um, I have to be passionate about wh what I'm working on, even though I'm making money on it. Or this morning, uh, the gentleman that announced me on stage, I, I always give him a hard time because he has things in his head that are preventing him from working on his really awesome business because he thinks you know, there's a bigger business out there that he should be working on when his business is pretty awesome. Uh, you should ask him about it. Uh, but uh, you know, high level, it's just like, just think through these things that you're believing in today that might not be true or that might be holding you back. Uh, and related to that, uh, I have a motto, and all of you are going to be frustrated by it for sure. My motto is, the only way to do more is do more. So I'm going to leave you with that. Thank you so Thank much. You. you guys give him a wonderful round of applause. We appreciate you coming out. They'll, they'll unhook oh, you. Thank you so much.